From UFOs to psychic powers and government conspiracies, history is riddled with unexplained events. You can turn back now or learn the stuff they don't want you to know. A production of iHeartRadio. Hello, welcome back to the show. My name is Matt. My name is Noel. They call me Ben. We are joined, as always, with our super producer, Paul Mission Control Deccant. Most importantly, you are you, you are here, and that makes this the stuff they don't want you to know. Today, fellow conspiracy realists, we are going underground, literally. If you live in almost any city, you probably already have some sense of just how much stuff is beneath the surface, invisible either by accident, negligence, or in some cases by design. I am, full disclosure, exploring a subterranean area near me. Stay tuned for updates on that. But that that got me thinking, I think this was on our collective minds for quite some time. You know, you think about what's underground, you think subway tunnels, sewage lines, catacombs, maybe government bunkers, and in some cases, entire neighborhoods lay abandoned beneath the dirt. In today's episode, we're exploring the story of one of those mysterious structures in particular. It's part of a local legend in Springfield, Missouri, the so-called Vampire Tunnels. But first, everyone, if you're in a safe place, if you're not driving or whatnot, or on a plane, look down. What do you think's beneath your feet? What do you think's under the surface? Here are the facts. There's an entire world down there. It's a crawl space for sure. Yeah, no doubt. And I know we're all uh, uh, totally um, losing our minds with Elden Ring. And I just found this area in Elden Ring. You go into this temple thing and then there's this platform with mystical shimmers on the side. And it just goes and goes and goes and just keeps going down, 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 down until there's this gorgeous uh, subterranean world occupied by these like barnacle covered wispy spear bearers who one shot kill you the moment you try to just take a look around and take in all the beauty but it sure is pretty and and creepy and terrifying oh yes it's very difficult area good luck to you sir thank you sir um but yeah to your point ben it's underneath most urban areas most cities Uh, i was joking about where i am because i'm just in a a house kind of in the suburbs of atlanta that does have a crawl space which is underground and there's earth down there (laughs) it's weird and kind of creepy but in most urban spaces especially if you're in the city it's weird to think how much of an iceberg the you know what do they call it the top streets or the uh what is it in london the high streets yeah (laughs) like (laughs) how much is below them high streets (laughs) <laughs> oh yeah, especially in a place as old as London. Yeah, uh, Europe is Europe and the Middle East are chock full of these hidden hidden areas, you know, and they're they're bigger than Elden Ring too, honestly. Uh, I I I got to say I don't know how many people one shot you down there, but you do need to be careful. Uh we get so used to the cacophonous grind of human activity on the surface on those high streets. We see it in the air. The air is chock full of towering structures. There are aircraft everywhere. Uh, But beneath it all, there is an often ignored substructure, superstructure, and they're all around the world. The U.S. has them, China, Turkey has a ton, uh, South America, Europe, uh, the rest of Asia, the Middle East. People have been building these things since before the dawn of the written word. And it makes a lot of sense because think about it, you're, you're... humans in the early days of the human fad and you need protection from the elements and from other hostile organisms so it makes sense to go to ground caves are like houses that have already been made for you so you can just expand on those some are so so incredibly old like katal uh in modern day turkey we're not turkish speakers so pardon our pronunciation there uh check out our episode for more on that no spoilers is very freaky and we think we may have figured out part of why it was built but uh we might have to do an update on that one depending on when the world ends 
Oh, yeah. And I mean, you know, much like, say, the, the catacombs in Paris or a lot of these subterranean tunnels underneath London, uh, many of these are the result of several phases, multiple phases of, of building, of construction that often can happen for different reasons throughout history. Uh, and you're, people are just building on top of things that preexisted and like used to serve a purpose, like the catacombs in Paris, again, which are like, you know, were burial sites. Um, and as we know, I believe it was in Paris that a lot of that stuff started to come up. Uh, it started to become unearthed, you know, due to like water um, drainage or lack thereof, like in the soil. And so there was a real issue with having to dig up all those bones that were just coming out of the earth and shove them all in a different place where they wouldn't, you know, come back to life. But where one generation might establish basic structures, later generations will continue to, like I said, build on top of it um, that results in something like a kind of, you know, preserved time capsule left over underground. Mm -hmm. Yes, you can see the story of a city's evolution, you know, because uh, all cities started out as encampments, basically, based on uh, geography or necessity. And only later did they become the New York's or really the, the European capitals and the African cities of note. And and just to apply it to a lot of to a big theme of this episode, a lot of those encampments start right near a water source. And that oh, has a yeah. lot to do with what's going on in this episode today. Just like uh, just like the excellent civilization series, you want to start your first city close to water if you can swing it. And that's that's based on what real life ancient cultures did. And, you know, when I, I've I think we've talked about this off air before, but it's something that fascinates me about a city like Atlanta, Atlanta even back when it was Terminus, is such an anomalous thing for a city of its size because it's not near a big navigable water source. What would have been the water source has been replaced, first by rail and then by, you know, the world's busiest airport. So it's fascinating. I don't know if it is a if it's sustainable in the long term, but I guess that's depends on how you want to de define long term. Uh, let's talk a little bit about all right, so I have I have brief ill-fated personal experience with the largest official underground structure of this sort. It's in Montreal. It could be called an underground city. In fact, that's literally what its name is. Uh, it's La Ville Souterraine. Uh, it, pardon to the French speakers. This is not a secret hideout for a relict population of mole people or anything that sinister, actually. I've got a lot of nice restaurants. Uh, it's a vast series of all these interconnected shopping centers underground, businesses, residential complexes like apartment areas, hotels, even office towers are part of this. And we're talking over 20 miles of tunnels, over four and a half mi square miles of area. And this, if like, it's easy to get into as well, because, again, it's not secret. It's not classified. It's public knowledge. People go there every day. Somebody might be in Montreal listening to this show in this underground city now because it's that big. Uh, there are more than 120 known entry points, not counting metro station entrances. But we just want to give you a sense of the scale here in terms of timeline and in terms of sheer size. But today's episode is not about Montreal's underground city, nor is it about Beijing's underground city, which is a whole other thing. Both of them are fascinating. They're not particularly sinister, any more so than uh, your average city would be. But rumor has it, there is something weird going on underground in Springfield, Missouri. The story starts with something called Jordan's Creek, home, so the legend says, to vampires. Here's where it gets crazy. Now, before we dive in, now, Matt, this is uh, one in particular that's been on the docket for years and years and years. And uh, I can't remember when we first talked about it. Was it the YouTube days? Uh, it might have been the YouTube days. I want to say a listener mm. uh, let us know about this at some point, wrote to us, sent us a voicemail or something like that. And it was a story I think they had seen on Reddit about mm. Jordan Creek and a particular part of it that uh, is covered. So let's let's talk a little bit um, a little bit more about Springfield, Missouri, and Jordan mm. Creek and why it's important. Have you guys been to Springfield? No, Matt, I haven't. No, never. It's 
I, it, it has some great outdoor stuff. Uh, it has uh, some museums that I quite enjoy. It's not the biggest city in Missouri. It's the third largest. And this is very, it's very much a Midwestern city in a Midwestern state. And the population is, all, right now, it's a little bit under 170,000 people. So it, it is definitely a city, but it's not necessarily on par with, you know, your Chicago's or your New York's. But still, like any place, it has problems. It has some um, longstanding uh, racial disparity and tension, but that's pretty much every city in the U.S., you know, if you associate with something, a lot of people, when they think of Missouri, they think of barbecue. They might think of Uncle Tupelo, maybe Wilco. They might think of uh, Bass Pro Shops, if you like to fish. They're headquartered in Missouri. But I, I, don't, I don't think a lot of us hear the word Missouri or Springfield and immediately go, boom, vampires. Unless I'm wrong. Unless I just wasn't talking to the right people in Springfield. No. Yeah, I've only been to St. Louis. Uh, I didn't see any vampires there, so I can only speak to to St. Louis. Well, you know, uh, it just a weird thing about the title of this episode and the title of this topic. Uh, I would say a lot of people don't associate creeks or underground water flow with vampires, but uh, yeah. <laughs> it's something that we got going on here, apparently. Dude, that is such a good point, because anybody who's familiar with the old the old uh, Western and Central European derived stories of vampires, you know that running water is a big deal breaker for those guys. They can't, in many cases, they can't cross it. And that we can one day do a, a show if we haven't yet about the evolution of vampire myths. It's, it's fascinating. It's super old, but you make such an excellent point there, man, because it would be one of the last places that a, a typical vampire, according to Western folklore, would like to reside. But uh, but yeah, Jordan Creek is is home to this vampire myth. And this vampire myth is um, something we have to dive into. So if you go back into the early history of the land that is called Missouri now, you know, thousands and thousands and thousands of years before Europeans arrived in this area, it was home to multiple Native American populations, the Kickapoo, the Lenape, as well as the Osage. Uh, this was a home to, this area is home to what Europeans would later call Jordan Creek. And it's a creek system that today runs beneath modern day Springfield. And this is, there's another interesting Atlantic comparison here because the building we've been in for a long time on Ponce de Leon Avenue has an underground stream that feeds into a cistern hidden in the tower. And it was paved over back in the day. The street is named Ponce de Leon because long time ago, someone was ripping off people by saying they had discovered the fountain of youth <laughs> and it was this stream. Uh, and they, you know, they sold, they sold a fake cure for anything that ails you for like a nickel or something or whatever the script was at the time. And this, so and, and in Springfield, this Creek is the reason that people settled in this area. It was, I believe one family that moved in, started like settled on that Creek or right around that Creek in the area that now has uh, downtown Springfield in it. And then just a civil or a, a town, I guess, arose from that, uh, from that family. Yeah. Town's like a mini civilization. And around that area, you also have these small caves that are along the side of the creek, which is going to uh, be an important part of the story a bit later. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's it, it's an important part of the early story, and it's an important part of the legend, right? So these things are true. There is a Jordan Creek. There, uh, there are and were a series of small caves that were along the sides of this creek, like you said, Noel, as more and more Europeans and uh, European-American settlers moved into this area in the 1800s, construction kicked into high gear. One thing I, I, didn't, uh, one thing I didn't put in the notes here, but I got to tell you guys because it's so ridiculous. The town is named Springfield. There's a legend about this. Apparently, the town is named Springfield because there was a vote over what they should call this town when they decided to make it a permanent thing. And one guy who was from Springfield, Massachusetts, said, let's name it after my hometown. Uh, and anybody who votes for my idea, I'll give you whiskey. So 
also a little huh. bit of a history of rigging elections. I hadn't heard that. I, it's so mm-hmm. funny how tales of the history of a town like that exist. What I'd heard is that the one of the original settlers noticed, like, within the field, there was this little um, access to a very deep well, and they called it mm. the Springfield. And again, I feel like you could, there's so many Springfields, as you say, that probably happens pretty frequently, and people have the same idea, all, all those great minds thinking alike. <laughs> <laughs> Well, it is it is true, I believe, that one of those founding families did settle purposely at a specific spot because they found a natural spring. So mm-hmm. let, let us know. I, I, I like the rigged whiskey vote just because. I like that way better. <laughs> it, it, it's a fun story. But either way, uh, I, I, either way, people were pretty loose with how they named towns as, as Europeans expanded into what would later become the United States. Send us your favorite weird town name. There are. There are thousands already. The very first developers of the town did something really cool. They used those pre-existing caves as a kind of early HVAC system, or really just AC system, because the subterranean air was cooler, and they could channel that cold cave air into surface buildings. Uh, There's a theater that's an example of this in town. It was one of the first air-conditioned buildings in Springfield. And so this construction boom occurs, and it starts to lead to trouble. The roofs of the buildings that are, you know, being constructed willy-nilly across the entire area, every time it rains, they're funneling increasingly large amounts of water into the creek, and floods become a regular thing. You know this because newspaper articles from the mid-1800s are always talking about it. Flooding is going crazy. There's not really a garbage collection system at this point either. So every time it rains, uh, the creek doesn't just flood with water. It floods with filth, animal waste, you know, uh, byproducts of the livestock industry, human fecal matter. It's everywhere. And the townsfolk are getting uh, getting pretty fed up with this. Harumph, harumph, harumph. Something must be done. They came up with the idea of burying the creek alive. I'm being a little bit overly poetic, but not much. They wanted to cap it. They wanted to cover it such that when it flooded, it would just go essentially through a big pipe instead of, you know, throwing poop all over the town. Well, it's also, it was thought to be a way to kind of protect the creek from all the debris and stuff coming from civilization in that downtown area, right? So if you if you cap it, you cover it with a tunnel, then that debris is going to at least sit on top of the concrete structure rather than seeping into the water, which could be great. Less pollution in your water source? I like that. So let's uh, let's see. What did they do? Did they actually do it, Ben? Uh, yeah, guys, they did it. Uh, they sprang into action, not a spring joke promise, and they built these tunnels that they called boxes. So they enclosed sections of the creek, and these this series of boxes originally was about two-thirds of a mile starting at Water Street and Main Avenue going east, leading to where the creek went to the James River. And after this construction, you've got what Tim Heidecker would call free real estate. The boxes get paved over. People build structures. They build actual buildings on top of this this paved area. So really, the more I think about it, it's it's not crazy to say the creek was buried alive because they genuinely did build and use structures atop it. But isn't that kind of like a bit of a dodgy foundation to build a whole new set of structures on? I mean, there's (laughs) there's some serious pilings in there, some bedrock uh, metal and stuff and concrete i don't know it looks pretty strong to me okay, <laughs> you say so. but that's not the only tunnel that we're going to talk about today uh there's another tunnel uh another tunnel game in town as, as you say ben uh a place called the springfield underground i love a good underground mm-hmm. this was this is a cool one uh you can find it's super cool yeah you can find a lot of neat stuff about this first it's huge And just like the Jordan Creek, it did not start as an underground thing. It was an open pit limestone quarry back in 46, 1946. And uh, they started digging tunnels in 1954 to create open space, storage space, essentially. 
that would later pave the way for a bunch of underground facilities. And these are still active, like truckers go into Springfield underground. Yeah, it's huge. I mean, we can't can't tell you how huge it is. Like, just for instance, right now, if you head to springfieldunderground.com and you're in need of some cold storage, so not freezing cold, but around what they call ambient 62 degrees Fahrenheit, uh, you can right now lease 114,000 square feet from Springfield Underground. <laughs> yeah. Again, 114,000 square feet. As of 2019, it was 3.2 million square feet of space under all mm-hmm. underground, right? And all at that nice cavernous temperature. Uh, you can find this on Google Maps. The address is 3610 East Kearney Street. Uh, apparently, it's just east of US 65. But that's, again, that's not a secret. It is huge. Nope. It, it is uh it is huge enough to be suspicious. You'll find some truckers who wonder uh, whether it is used for military purposes or whether it has been in the past, because it looks like it'd be a good bunker, honestly. Uh, mm-hmm. But it looks like an amazing bunker. My goodness. Can you can you imagine uh, you'd be protected from all the elements? It would be tough to really get a food source source going down there unless you had some ec- excellent lights, maybe. You know, those yeah. uh, lights that'll help you grow hydroponics? You could live off the uh, largesse of Kraft Foods because they were the <sighs> second people in that space or the second <laughs> company. It was their first refrigerated space. But OK, so we're establishing this. So another another true thing we have established. There's a lot of stuff going on beneath the surface in Springfield, Missouri. But the question we haven't answered yet is uh, what's up with the vampires? We'll pause for a word from our sponsor, and then we'll take a bite out of this story. This story's no. neck. Not all going to work. All right, we've returned. Here's the crux of the story. What gives with the vampires? You know, every town worth its salt. Shout out to Mark Rolanski, author of the book Salt. Read it if you haven't yet. Every town has its own local legends. Like if you grew up near Lake Lanier, you've heard tons of legends about that lake. And, you know, Matt, I'm sure uh, you had you had encountered some of those growing up nearby, right? Yeah, absolutely. The uh, the town that was flooded or the whole, the large swath of land that was flooded to create Lake Lanier, which included a town and a cemetery True story. and church yeah. and where people used to live before it was flooded. Mm. Uh, yeah, and every year people go missing in Lake Lanier quite often. Uh, you get a nice mixture of debris at the bottom of that lake, which is very murky, and you know, plant life that you can get tangled up in with those actual human structures with the tendency for people to drink when they go out on boats. Seems uh, rife for a spooky story or film. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Shh. <laughs> and and no. I'm sure Augusta has many uh, local like legends or urban legends or rumors as well, right? Can you recall any? Uh, well, uh, I'm sure there were some awful white people that did some murders. Um, oh yeah, if yeah, you yeah, dig yeah. deep enough, yeah. Uh, yeah, I, not, I don't know. <laughs> well, you know what? That's not true. There is uh, a haunted pillar. Uh, in Augusta. Uh, it's just a pillar. I don't remember the story behind it, but it is referred to collectively as the Haunted Pillar. And uh, some friends of mine actually had a small little record label they named after that back in the 90s. So that's that's the, that's the only truly urban legend that I can think of based in Augusta. And and the point stands. Every, every place has its own collection. It's part of the fabric that binds a human community together. This legend of vampires Living in the tunnels beneath Springfield, though, it's it's fascinating because it's actually pretty recent. It dates back not to some ancient myth, but instead to a specific news article from 2007 in the Springfield News Leader. At this point, we want to introduce you to a student named Lacalia Wiggins. She was 15 years old at the time of this story. And she was a brilliant kid. She was a young prodigy getting an early start at a place called Drury University. Uh, 
And she was kind of bookish, right? As a lot of a lot of brilliant kids are. But she wanted to fit in, you know, she wanted to be part of the in crowd, like a lot of kids do. She wanted to have friends. And this weird series of circumstances uh, led her going to a library that she wouldn't normally go to. Uh, her math tutor class had been canceled, or her appointment with her math tutor had been canceled. So she went to a place called the Midtown Carnegie Branch of the Springfield Library, and she thought she'd run into some people she knew. But instead, she met a group of new people who had become her new friends. They apparently had a heck of a lot of uh, revelations to drop on her. They asked her several odd questions. We're not sure what they specifically asked her. And then, eventually, they mentioned she might be a vampire, but not just a vampire. According to this story, they told her that perhaps in another life or previous life, she had been a vampire queen. She was in charge of stuff. Oh, and she was a vampire. Remember, remember that part. Um, so, so this is a, you know, a new group of people that are just kind of telling her things. It's a bit weird. Right. I'm trying to imagine myself in that situation. Like, how would I feel if I just met a new group of people and they're telling me that it would feel probably quite flattering, uh, kind of exciting. But I imagine there's a, quite a bit of skepticism that could go into that conversation. Uh, um, so but what happened after this encounter? Yeah, you have to ask yourself if someone is a vampire, why are they out during the day? Why are they not, you know, suffering horrible reactions to religious iconic iconography or uh, or garlic or whatever? Apparently, it's because she needed to be awakened. That's that's when she would realize her past life as a vampire queen. I'm also interested in the escalation there. Um, they said whatever was happening, they gave her a bit of a hard sell. They needed to awaken her soon because a grand reckoning was imminent, a looming war between the forces of good and the powers of evil. And as a vampire, she's on the powers of good? Unclear. <laughs> we are the good vampires. We are the white hat vampires of <laughs> Springfield, Missouri. <laughs> So for the next two months, uh, Lacalia would hang around with these folks. They had their own little clubhouse kind of situation, a little hideaway in the tunnels underneath the city. Uh, and she'd learn about vampiric folklore uh, and even watch some of the group's members, about 20 or so strong, um, cut themselves and drink, or at the very least, taste, lick each other's blood. Uh, and a lot of the folks in this group kind of considered themselves a bit of a clan almost or a kind of a cultic kind of situation. They were uh, similar ages or a little bit younger. Um, a lot of them came from, um, you know, kind of rough backgrounds. They were street kids. Um, and there were a few older members. And the leader of the group was a guy in his 20s. And Lakalia believed the members of the clan were associated with street level, non vampiric uh, crime, almost like a, a Fagin and Oliver Twist and like a Lost Boys kind of situation. Actually, the more I'm thinking about it, it's very like the, the Joel Schumacher Lost Boys kind of scenario. Living underneath the city, doing crimes, not necessarily vampire crimes, so not entirely the same. A similar vibe. Wonder if they wore leather jackets and rode sweet motorcycles yeah it reminds me of uh street kids you know traveling kids for anybody who's been in the traveler community the age di the age discrepancy is a uh, red flag honestly because in those this has all the makings of a cult based on the information we have now a space c u l t not o c c u l t a cult as the basis of it so far but we gotta have a record scratch at this point <laughs> Perfect. This sounds like a lot already, right? This sounds like maybe it could be exaggerated because so far they just have the word of the kid uh, who is a minor at this time. Journalists investigating this story thought so too. So they checked around and uh, we, we just want to jump outside of time here, outside of a linear narrative for a bit and confirm that they did check with Lacalia's mother, one Latanya Wiggins. She's uh, she was a local first grade school teacher and she she confirmed this and more. And then she said she'd also been suspended from her job just for telling her coworkers about this story. So that's that's a weird shutdown. And whenever you have some kind of 
shut down on a story like that. It just feeds speculation. It's pouring gasoline onto the fire. But the investigators also, just for the record, they they went to the place Lecalia uh, told them about, and they found something in the Jordan Creek drainage tunnel. Yeah. Surprisingly, and well, maybe not surprisingly, they found evidence that people were living there. Some people, not sure who, it was just signs of almost an encampment or something. And just a pause here for one moment. There's a YouTube video you can watch, Ben, that I think you found. It was linked in an article here from that same news site where it's a just a kid at night going through the tunnels and looking. And there's this one particular place where uh, I've seen rumors that, that this is the place where kids were living or somebody was living, and, which is now barred off and you can't access it anymore. Uh, but th- this is the same thing that these investigators at the time found. Yeah, and if you've ever been to like a hobo jungle or crash pad, you know, you know the look. It's a bunch of stuff strewn around, you know, cast off furniture, and tents, and things. And uh, Lacalia did say that members of what they called the clan, with a C, would live there. Uh, every so often or on and off, you know, come and go just kind of like a punk house, like a gutter punk house. And as a result, uh, the group just called this squat, the house, not a vampire joke, but Lacalia was mesmerized and things started to reach a climactic point as Halloween loomed on the horizon. She ran away from her mother's house. And when Lacalia's mom, Latanya couldn't find her, like any any parent, she understandably panicked. She filed a missing persons report with the local PD. At this point, we do have to pause here because whenever we mention filing a missing persons report, we need to bust a very dangerous myth. This is, this is hugely important, folks. If you have a loved one or someone you care about or just someone you know uh, and, they're, and they have gone missing – and you are expecting them, you do not have to wait 24 hours to file a missing persons report. You should not wait 24 hours. Uh, Like, do it as soon as you think something is seriously amiss, because those 24 hours can make a world of difference in the likelihood of you finding that person. It's a really excellent point. And also, I mean, a little suspicious if someone waits that long, no? The trope is that the police would force you to wait that long. Oh. Yeah, unfortunately, a lot of crime fiction has ruined that for people. Um, and then, you know, people say, oh, I don't want to bug the police unless there's something seriously wrong. But uh, the truth of the matter is that is a myth. So hop on it if you have concerns. Uh, and this time it worked. Police did find Lecalia later that evening. She and her new vampiric or pseudo vampiric friends were going to reportedly uh, they were going to buy some scissors and ritualistically cut her hair. They were going to go to a nearby cemetery and they'd have this ceremony that would awaken the vampire queen within her. But the police caught wind of it and they uh, preemptively kind (laughs) of head them off at the pass or nip them in the bud, whichever one you prefer. Um, Lakalia was returned to her home. And although she did cooperate with police, Lakalia was apparently pretty hostile to her parents when she came home. She doesn't exactly strike me as the most mellow youth. She referred to her parents, using this as a term of abuse, uh, as humans. She hissed. She spat. Um, She eventually began to see a counselor, which is probably the right move. Um, And thankfully, uh, after a little bit of time, you know, speaking to this person, she started to return back to her normal personality. But that's when uh, some new wrinkles started to present themselves in the form of death threats. Did we talk about what the actual uh, ritual was supposed to be? Not yet. It, uh, okay. it, it culminates in uh, a nightmare for anybody with hygiene issues uh, <laughs> because this, this ceremony probably involved some, you know, some high fluting language. Right to build out the mythos of the group, depending on what they were doing, and there are questions about that too. But it culminated in having you, as the initiate, 
drink the blood of someone who identified as a vampire and then having them drink your blood in return. So that's not not good hygiene. No. Yeah, that's gross. No. It's super gross. Doesn't seem like that much of a ritual, right? Is, well, don't you usually have to die to become a vampire? Well, they're they're they're, Come on, they're, they're styling on it a little bit. I mean, this is sort of uh this is some Anne Rice level ritualistic behavior, I would say. From the outside looking in, it feels maybe a bit performative and edgy, but uh everybody's everybody's been a teenager. Most people have been a teenager at some point. So this gets serious, though. The death threats are coming in. There are anonymous notes saying, you know, your tongue will be cut out for betraying the clan and strangers were sending, like, people, she could probably guess who they were, but uh, strangers were sending death threats. And this, this story, this whole series of events we've just outlined is what brought the idea of the vampire tunnels to larger public attention. But how much of this is actually true? We're going to pause for a word from our sponsors and return to the story of the Vampire Tunnels. And we're back with more on the uh, Vampire Tunnels of Springfield, Missouri. Uh, Ben, you posed uh, before the break. How much of this is true? Well, one thing we do know is true is the tunnels themselves and the area where this group, this clan, had their little hideaway. They referred to as the house. Can you describe the way that looked, Ben? Mm, I think we can. Let's let's uh, crowdsource it. Okay, a, a crowd of three. Uh, so uh, yeah, so the tunnels are very real, and that area they were in that we described as looking like a, a crash pad for people who didn't have permanent living situations. Uh, it was. It's still underground, but it's it's removed from the drainage area, right? Would you agree with that, Matt? I think you saw the, some yeah. of the same videos. Yeah. What I, what I saw was that this place would be safe if there was flooding or at least it was safer if there was flooding within the drainage I area, see. because you can kind of see where the walls go up. And then this part is between the ceiling concrete within the tunnel and within the kind of the, I don't know, I guess you would call it the top of the tops of the walls. It looks to me like where. Uh, some structure has been built on top of these tunnels. And this is like the underneath of that building, almost like a crawl space area mm. that's kind of accessible to go into from the tunnels. You guys, you, you've, you've both seen the lost boys. I mean, I can't not picture the lost boys hang out beneath uh, uh, the streets of San Dimas, you know, where star and, uh, and all the other guys live. with our buddy, Alex winter sporting an amazing uh, uh, kind of a white boy, Jerry curl in that film. And of course, Kiefer and uh, Jason Patrick, but that's what I'm picturing. Yeah. I was thinking of the uh, lost boy references as well. Looking into this, I'll tell you what though, the lost boys hang out in that film is uh, an order of magnitude, more extravagant and cool. This is definitely, this is definitely like a hidden crawl space kind of area, but it's pretty big. Mm -hmm. It's not your average, you know, ranch home crawl space. Don't think of it that way. You could stand up, you could walk around. Uh, yeah. But yeah, but the, that part is real. And Lacalia's stepfather, a guy named David Morton, came back to that area. He went with a couple of folks after his stepdaughter left the group or the clan, he came there to get her backpack. And he said, quote, it was strange. This is when he's speaking to the paper. He says, you go back there and there's graffiti with whatever weird stuff. It's pitch black. When we were there, there were probably 10 to 12 transient street kids up there. So it's also not much of a secret in town. I'd like to give a big shout out to this awesome forum called Underground Ozarks. Go to undergroundozarks, all one word, dot com. This is a great resource for urban exploration in the area. And folks on this forum are very well aware of the tunnel. They even It even has an exciting nickname, Hell's Church, uh, but it's very tongue in cheek. And I think that's specifically the area we're talking about that we're describing, the house, the room, all of that. Mm -hmm. I think that is what they are referring to as Hell's Church. Yeah, yeah. I mean, he, just to humanize a little more, someone threw a barbecue down there in 2005. People talk about racing ATVs there. Uh, explorers in the air, in the forum have long been aware of a possible 
possibly hostile at times presence from uh, people they describe as transients or vagrants. But if you go on that, just know this in advance, folks, if you go on those forums and you talk about it being a vampire clan, you're going to get laughed out of the room, the digital room. Uh, There are, of course, there are dangers with running into anyone, even plain old garden variety humans down there in the dark. Uh, That's why you'll see posters on the forum say, go in a group, at least use the buddy system just in case there might be some people who are intoxicated or who are looking for trouble. And yes, there are also bats because a tunnel like this is perfect for bats. Those bats also seem to be, you know, just plain bats, not even vampire bats, just regular bats. It's they're they're actually kind of cute looking. I've seen some I've seen some of the beats. They're they're very cute. We cheat for the beats. Uh, you can <laughs> you can also you know if you'd like you can find lots of anecdotes about the tunnel from people who have explored it while they were in the area. And there was one that really stood out to me from a redditor who was talking on about this on the Springfield subreddit. It's kind of a long quote, but it's a cool story. So maybe we can uh, maybe we can break it up and, and approach it as a group. My favorite story from those tunnels is once I went into the Bat Cave slash Hell's Church and found a crummy folding table with a pentagram and little tea light candles on it and like razor blades and cigarette butts and just general edgy teenager stuff. And next to it was a backpack. What? Guys, this is, this is not part of the quote. What? They found a backpack. I mean, this is them, Maybe right? Her this is the, the leavings of the, of the clan, clearly. Or some copycatters. Maybe. Let's go back in. Presumably left by one of the participants. Yeah, we think it was. It was like a normal high school kid's backpack with textbooks and whatnot. But there was a five-subject notebook with a big pentagram on it. And the little subject separator tabs actually had labels in them. And I still laugh about it to this day. The first section was labeled members. And it had a list of names with their, like, goth persona name next to it. Like Travis Keller, Darkfire. Sarah Paulson, Lady Shadow. Stuff like that. Then the next section was labeled spells and had all these papers printed off the internet with various Wiccan stuff. Uh, Then the last section was labeled trivia and was a running scoreboard of what looked to be a Harry Potter trivia leak. Nice. And and this commenter, uh, you can find this online, but just just because of Reddit rules, we're not going to say their username right now. Uh, But this Redditor closes with this oddly wholesome line, I thought, and says... I like to think whoever's notebook that was is now all grown up and has a successful career in human resources or administration because it does seem organized, you know? Yeah. (laughs) Or, or, and just hear me out, the poster on Reddit is the person who made that notebook. Yes, (laughs) quite possibly. (laughs) You never know. You never know. And her name is Sarah Paulson. Her name was Sarah Paulson. Her name is Sarah Paulson. (laughs) Her name is Sarah Paulson. (laughs) So in this case, if we we can make a we can arrive at somewhat of a verdict here, it seems that these could just be kids playing you know harmless, somewhat edgy games, right? These could be, especially in more recent years, what are portrayed as vampires could actually be LARPers playing Vampire the Masquerade, which is a fun game. LARPer means live action role playing. Trust us, you'll know it when you see it, if it's happening around you, because uh, they go all in, all in sometimes. Yeah, Lightning bolt. Yeah. <laughs> Lightning bolt. Uh, so, uh, yeah, you can see an example of this, for instance, in the um, newest Hawkeye series on, on Disney. Uh, there's a lot of LARPing in there. But on the other side, this could, this could be representative of a nascent cult, like a charismatic older leader taking advantage of young and or disadvantaged children and building a cult of personality based on, you know, a hodgepodge or grab bag of amateur occult beliefs. Um, Happy to report. I am happy to report that the time of this recording, Lacalia Wiggins uh, is doing just fine. Seems to have survived uh, with no ill, ill effects. And this story was reported originally with a little bit of tongue-in-cheek stuff there too, right? To kind of, um, it it was self-aware that it was feeding into the satanic panics that crop up in the U.S. every so often. And then since this story emerged during the age of the internet, 
and there's enough truth to it for it to be fascinating. It's no wonder that so many people took it for fact. And most of the people who took it for fact do not live in Missouri, let alone Springfield. Although it may sound like we're busting a bunch of myths here, we do have to note it is very true that the U.S. is chock full of hidden, occluded communities, cults, groups with all sorts of eccentric, strange beliefs and practices. You just don't hear about them as often. They're part of what I like to call invisible America. They're underground in more ways than one. And I would love to do uh, I would love to do a separate podcast on them. Um, there are there is also one more, at least one more Springfield vampire case that happened much later, unrelated to this in 2016, uh, also with a teenager, 19 year old named Victoria Vanatar. Yeah, um, this one is is really quite depressing. Uh, it's reported on by KSHB out of Kansas City. And they reported it um, this way. Uh, 19-year-old Victoria Van Adder, Van Adder, perhaps, um, allowed her intoxicated boyfriend to drink her blood, and then she stabbed him um, during an argument that came uh, soon after. Um, when the police arrived at their home, they discovered the bloodied couple and the words, I'm sorry, written inside a heart, scrawled in blood on the wall. That's romantic. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's, it's a very uh, the crow. Like the crow. Very misinformed. Uh Venator yeah. warned. Yeah. Uh, it just makes me sad. I mean, look, look, I mean as a father of a 13-year-old burgeoning kind of moody goth teen, this kind of stuff really freaks me out. Let me just say that and be real. I mean, I know it's not something that she's going to go down this road or anything, but it's like, god, you really give your kids a hug, man. You know, don't let them become weird, blood sucky vampire weirdos. Just don't let it happen. Just show them a little love. Only you can prevent vampirism. It's true. It's true. <laughs> no, I don't know. <laughs> oh yeah, no, give it a shot. So yeah, this story it does end on a on a sad note, or at least the time it happened in 2016. Uh, Vanatar said Vanatar was was inebriated, according to reports, and warned investigators that she had the potential to become a serial killer. Turns out she had already uh, been jammed up for two previous assaults. Uh, we don't have an update on there, that end yet, but we just wanted to put that, in, put that in there for anybody who's wondering about the other Springfield vampire-esque story. They're two separate incidents. But with all this, now that we've walked through the facts and the fiction here, you may ask, be asking, guys, I like urban exploring. I love it. I wonder what you all are getting into off air. And I want to see this vampire tunnel for myself. Well, you are in luck. This is how much of not a secret this is. The tunnels are open for tours. All you have to do right now is go to watershedcommittee.org and you can arrange a look-see. Uh, You can't go by yourself at midnight, not legally at least. The tour groups need to have at least eight people. Uh, They're going to be about two hours long, and they're conducted sometime between 8 a.m. to 5 p.m. Monday through Friday. So a vast conspiracy, this is not. But if you do want to take that tour, get V to the website now. You may not have the chance to do so for much longer. There's been a long movement underway to dig the creek up in a process they call daylighting as part of a larger downtown revitalization effort. And it got it got held off from COVID, but I think they're going to go through with it because they've they've got a lot of local support behind it. Yes, I actually I called the Springfield, Missouri project manager who's working on this. Uh, his name's Kirkland. And he said, uh, just had, he had some really interesting things to say. So in the 20s, when they built that tunnel system over the creek there, the thought was, as we stated before, that it would control the flooding. But it turns out it's nowhere big enough to control the flooding uh, when when there's enough water, like the 100-year flood that will come through every 100 years or so. So the concept is, is to actually uh, open it up and make it more like an arroyo that we just talked about recently on the show, where it's more, it's more of an open space. 
And uh, there have been problems, but he assures me and us and everyone that construction is going to begin in the first quarter of 2023 to change things up. And the last thing Kirkland said was he has not encountered any vampires within the tunnels. Well, of course he's going to say that, you know, <laughs> <laughs> and, and check that caveat within the tunnels. What's going on at the video <laughs> store? No spoilers, but what's going on with the video store? Lost Boys teaches you that's the first place you should check, uh, especially if it's still open in 2022. Anyway, also, some don't mysteries. eat the, don't eat the noodles. Seems- they might be maggots or they might be noodles and they just look mm. like maggots. Or they might be both. You know, these vampires are tricksy devils. And some mysteries, it seems, just can't last forever. That's our show, folks. And now it's time for uh, at least one of my favorite parts where we get to hear from you. What do you think? Is your neck of the global woods home to any similar subterranean legends? Are you a fan of urban exploration? If so, offer on the record, what's the strangest thing you've found so far? Can't wait to hear from you. Be very careful with that one, that last question. Make sure to let us know whether we can use your voice and or message on the air. But there's so many ways to find us. Why not hop online? You can do that. We have a presence. We have an online presence. Uh, You can find us on Facebook. You can find us on YouTube. And you can find us on Twitter under the handle Conspiracy Stuff. If you would prefer to uh, check us out in picture form, you can find us on Instagram. Our Instagram has recently got a bit of a kick in the pants. Uh, I've been really enjoying the content myself. Seeing some really great conspiracy memes, a lot of stuff that's uh, coming from the amazing um, posters over at Here's Where It Gets Crazy on Facebook that we're putting up on Instagram as well. Uh, and who knows, we might be doing some livey, wivey, timey, wimey type events over there too. You can find that at Conspiracy Stuff Show. Yes, there are other ways to contact us. You can dial one eight three three stdwytk When you call, you will hear Ben, and then you will hear a tone. After that tone, tell us your nickname. Whatever it is, it can be anything. Whatever your heart desires. Then you've got three minutes. Say whatever you'd like. Please include, if you give us permission, permission to use your voice and message on the air. That would be very helpful. If you've got more to say than can fit in the three minutes you are allotted for your voicemail message, why not instead send us a good old-fashioned email? We are conspiracy at iheartradio.com. Stuff They Don't Want You to Know is a production of iHeartRadio. For more podcasts from iHeartRadio, visit the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen to your favorite shows.